you put your cameras off, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi Tim. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thank you. We're just we're asking everybody if you don't mind to just mute sorry. their. Uh, no, sorry. no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, I'm I'm just about to about to do it. It, it to turn my mic on to mute, but uh, but not the camera. Thank you. Okay, I think that's one o'clock, so we can start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you didn't join us for the morning session, then a very warm welcome to new people that have joined us this afternoon. And if you were there, if you were with us this morning, welcome back. It's great to see you. Um, this afternoon is focused on the exciting 2021 first of a kind uh, competition. Thank you to Mark Cairns from the DFT and Innovate UK, who will introduce the new £9 million um, 2021 first of a kind challenge competition with a focus on supporting ideas that will make the rail network greener, cleaner and more passenger friendly. Um, then we'll hear from key Scottish um, rail sector stakeholders and more about their specific challenge areas. Thanks very much to Scott Rail, Evershot Rail and Caledonian Sleeper for supporting this event. We're really pleased to have McCulloch Rail, uh, a Scottish SME, uh, who will share details of their journey to success and our collaboration with Unipart Rail. This afternoon we'll conclude with our Cola Energy, um, who were recently awarded the Hydrogen Train Project, who will talk about its supply chain requirements and a recently issued hydrogen survey. This is a full agenda again for this session, which we're delighted about. And, and just to keep us all on track um, with timings, there's just a few housekeeping rules that I think I've mentioned. If you can turn your video off, mute your sound, um, that will not distract speakers um, or for you listening, all the people listening. Um, please use the chat facility to post any questions. Um, at breaks throughout the, the afternoon session, we'll run through, <coughs> excuse me, we'll run through the questions um, with the presenters. And if we don't manage to cover all the questions, we'll make sure that they get covered afterwards. Um, just to let you know, the presentation is being recorded today and will be available after the event. Um, for those of you who want to catch up on bits you might have missed, or if you, um, for people that haven't seen, um, haven't managed to attend today. <clears throat> um, I think that's uh, enough for me. Um, as I said in this morning's introduction, I really hope today will spark some ideas, provide food for thought, and most importantly, enable some valuable connections to be made that could potentially lead to greener, exciting innovations of the future for rail in Scotland. Please do get in touch with us at the Rail Cluster Builder if you have any ideas in this regard, and we'll do our best to um, point in the right direction and make the right connections. I'm now really delighted to hand over to Mark Cairns from the DFT, who will introduce the 2021 First of a Kind competition. We hope you enjoy the afternoon. Thanks, Shona. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Thanks and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am really pleased to be here at the Rail Innovation Day for Scotland. It's a first for me as the head of Rail Innovation Policy and Programmes for DFT. And I'm excited that uh, Scottish Engineering and Innovate UK have been able to work together to make this happen, even if we can't uh, all meet in person. Uh, I know we've got SMEs with innovative ideas and technologies here as well as rail industry bodies. So this really is the perfect way to launch our latest first of a kind competition in Scotland, because we need both to work together to make the most of the opportunities it offers. Uh, I think we all understand that new technology is fundamental to the railway's future and to tackling some of its key challenges. As you might know, in the autumn, the industry published its new rail technical strategy, which highlighted its vision and goals for 2025 and the innovations that would be required to achieve them. 
the government fully stands behind the industry on those. We want to see the railway running more efficiently and effectively with more reliable assets and making better use of data. Crucially, we want rail to play its part in achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and to provide the best experience possible for our customers. I know these are priorities that are important uh, for the rail cluster builder and that some of you will have heard from Network Rail this morning about them as well. And of course, along with these well-established challenges, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge impact on rail passenger demand. And so when it's safe and sensible for people to travel in large numbers again, it's also going to be essential to attract them back to rail and help them to travel with confidence. So that's another challenge for us. Now, of course, it's right that industry leads on uh, its own innovation to address these challenges and any others that may arise in the future. But there is a role that government can play as well in supporting it by helping companies like yours to overcome the difficulty and expense in demonstrating new products on the railway. And that is where the first of kind competition comes in. Through Innovit UK, we've made available around £25 million over the past four years to assist companies with uh, exciting new technology to trial that technology on our trains, our tracks and at our stations. We funded the first mainline trial of a hydrogen train in the UK and helped roll out an exhaust after treatment system to lower carbon emissions for current stock. We've supported systems to provide easier and better access to assistance for passengers with impairments and we've enabled technology which is helping trains to spot and report problems with overhead line equipment. So the benefits of our funding, as you can see, are, are being felt across the railway system. And so it was great that our rail minister, Chris Heaton Harris, announced on Tuesday that up to £9 million is going to be available for this year's competition, first of a kind, 2021. Once again, we're focusing funding on the issues that the department and industry together believe are the most pressing. And so there are three themes. The first is increasing customers' confidence and enhancing the experience. And that's focused on products which will reassure passengers that rail travel is safe and make the experience enjoyable and productive for them. The second is making the railway easy to use for all. Again, focused on the customer and by making their journeys as simple and straightforward as possible. And lastly, low emissions and a greener railway, because decarbonisation, of course, continues to be a very significant challenge for rail and particularly for freight. Um, but this theme actually extends uh, beyond that to rail's other impacts on the environment as well. So the Innovate UK team are going to speak to you in more detail about these. Um, themes and the other elements of the competition shortly uh, and then you'll hear from people in the rail industry themselves about their specific challenges. Um, but in a just a, a few short years we've already seen what we can achieve when innovators and industry work together with government support and with uh, the collective creativity, knowledge and expertise of, of people uh, here today and your, your peers uh, I'm certain that we can look forward to more exciting new solutions for the railway emerging from Scotland. So I just want to thank you for your time. And with that, I'm going to hand over to um, the Innovate UK team, Kevin Davis and Dan Piner. Thanks, Mark. And uh, I'll... I'll um... Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and, and the, the, the introduction to the uh, First of a Kind 2021 competition. I'm going to speak first. I'll set some of the ground rules for the, the competition and then I'll hand over to my colleague Dan Pepiner, uh, who will talk you through the detail of the competition. So as Mark says, uh, what we're presenting here is a funding opportunity. We've heard this morning an, about a number of the challenges from Network Rail. Uh, not all, but some of those challenges map quite nicely onto this competition. So there's an opportunity here to, 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 to apply for the funding and to, to deliver demonstrations to address these challenges in pretty short order, in fact, within, within, within nine months. Uh, Shona, am I driving or are you driving? Can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. A quick introduction to Innovate UK then. So, so if you have heard of us before, that's good news. Uh, if you haven't, we are the UK's innovation agency. We're a public uh, body that invests public funding to grow British industry 
uh, and we've we've just passed I think about our 13th birthday so so we've been around for a while and our historical investments are outlined here so, so a lot of funding flowing into the in, into British industry our primary object primary objective in fact is to, to grow the economy but in the case of working with departments such as Department for Transport, what we're equally looking to do is to deliver real solutions to the railway. So working with the innovation community, investing public funding to deliver benefit to the economy and to get technology out on the railway to solve the, to solve the current challenges. Thanks, Shana. Uh, and uh, there's a paradox here. Uh, this is the fifth first of a kind competition. Uh, it's a series that we started in 2017 and we've progressively worked through a number of key priority areas for the industry, uh, addressing concepts such as uh, trains of the future, stations of the future, uh, freight. Uh, and this is the fifth competition uh, because the theme is going well. So we are seeing now an increasing numbers of technologies developed through this competition delivered to the railways and making a real difference. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, the aims of the briefing. So, as Mark says, it's a real shame we're not meeting. It, we would have would have been delighted to to be in in Glasgow or Edinburgh today, um, meeting you in person. Uh, so we'll do what we can uh, online. But the objective is to set as much of a background for the competition we can as we can. Talk to you about the scope. We can answer some Q and A's at the end if Shona feels we've got time. Uh, after this presentation, we've got some presentations from 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 industry um, and in um, alignment with the network rail presentations this morning, the objective is to tell you what the challenges out there are that need addressing. Uh, also happy to highlight the roles of knowledge transfer network uh, and the catapults in making any connections. And it's also a chance for, for, for the audience here on the call today to meet each other and to, to, to develop networking opportunities particularly with the organisations that are going to speak after us uh, to outline the challenges that they see for their particular aspects of the industry. Thanks, Shona. So a summary of the competition. As Mark's mentioned, there is £9 million available, including VAT. Um, the three themes are listed here. So increasing customer confidence and enhancing the experience, delivering a railway that is easy to use for all and offering low emissions and a greener railway. Where do those themes come from? They come from a combination of the rail technical strategy, which was uh, rebooted last year by Rail Safety Standards Board, RSSB, um, uh, and from uh, industry bodies that, that sit on our steering committee and of course with DFT input. The good news is any organisation can apply to this competition. Academia is, is eligible, uh, SMEs, large organisations, so it's open to every organisation. Uh, all we require is that you must deliver a demonstration in the UK. Uh, the equally good news is it's 100% funded, so this is a procurement exercise. Innovate UK on behalf of Department for Transport will be procuring a demonstration of what your innovation delivers to the railways. Thanks, Shannon. So the objectives are to accelerate innovation in the UK rail sector. Uh, and the way we think that is most effective in, in addressing that is through the, the first of a kind format, which is reasonably well developed now after, after three or four years. What we want to see at the end of it is a demonstration of your technology working in its target environment, so on the railway network. Uh, and through that, we will demonstrate to the innovation, to your innovations to stakeholders and railway customers. Um, it may be obvious. If, if any organisation chooses to procure your innovation, that's a separate activity entirely. What Innovate UK is doing here is procuring the demonstration of your innovation with a view to you moving forward for com future commercialisation. Thanks, Shona. We've already mentioned the three themes. Um, the, the, the challenges for the railway have been dramatically affected, of course, by the, the pandemic, and, and the themes strongly reflect that. Um, but, but decarbonisation and low emissions and a greener railway remain um, a universal theme and, and are still retained for this competition. Thanks, Shona. So in terms of the timescales, before Dan takes you through the, the, the details of each theme, we expect projects to start on the 1st of July this year and they must end by the 31st of March 2022. They need to last up to eight, nine months. Uh, there are there are bands within the competition for shorter projects, which we expect to, 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 to be delivered more rapidly than that. Uh, and as I've mentioned, to lead a project, you must be any organisation and do your work in the UK. Uh, you can, we welcome applications from all sectors. If you're not a rail supplier, um, that's fine. Please, please get engaged with the rail industry. And this is a great opportunity for you to find your feet in that sector and to work with railway partners. 
the way the projects are formatted in this competition, uh, the, the work is with a lead uh, applicant, the contract is with the lead applicant, but you can let as many subcontracts as you need to achieve your objectives. Thanks, Sharon. So critically here then, we, we've learned that um, although uh, applications are welcome from any sector, the railway is a, a singularly complicated environment within which to work. So in order to bid into this competition, you must, you must have some relationships with an owner of railway assets, an experienced railway organisation, and a railway organisation that has the potential to be a customer. Again, this is simply to, to give you the best chance of succeeding that we can. Uh, it may seem like a, a bit of a, a hurdle to have to cross, but it's to give you the best opportunity of succeeding that you can through the experience we've had over several rounds of this uh, competition format. However, the, the, the criteria that I've listed just, just there can all be met by a single organisation, or indeed the lead applicant might be such an organisation. Um, so you must in, in, include a pen, potential integration partner. We've had several questions about that. By that, we mean a team that knows how to integrate uh, technology, if your application is technology, and knows how to integrate technology with the railways. To, to evidence that, we want a letter of support from a potential customer organisation. Uh, and if you are awarded a contract, uh, we would like to invite you to exhibit your project uh, in a year's time at our annual rail exhibition. I don't know if any of our audience today have have been um, over to the exhibition, which uh, ourselves, KTN and Rail Industry Association have been delivering, but many of our projects are showcasing their, their successes over there. Thanks, Shona. Um, if you've um, worked with First of a Kind before, there are a couple of changes. So we are really looking for new innovations. And for that reason, we are basically saying that, that teams that have been previously funded for, for the same or similar innovations will not be eligible for this competition. What do we mean by that? We basically mean that if you've, if you've applied, for instance, to do something in, passenger, in the passenger transport domain, uh, and now we saw an application to do the same or similar thing in freight, we, we would we would discourage you from that and we would ultimately potentially rule that as ineligible. So we're looking for applications which are materially different from previously funded activities and we'll work with our colleagues in DFT to make a decision on whether uh, an application is sufficiently uh, differentiated from, from predecessor applications. Thanks, Shona. Um, the three themes. There's a little bit of a structure to the to the to the competition, which is more complex than usual. We've already talked about the three themes, but because we're looking for rapid responses in a, in addressing themes one and themes two, we, we're asking teams to group. Well, we're asking the the portfolio to be grouped within two groups. So, group one projects are basically short and lower budget, and group two projects are longer and higher budget. Um, so, if you if you fit within group one, you'll be a a project uh, which is delivering something within three to six months for budgets of between 50 and 150k. If you're in group two, you have a bit longer to deliver, so so this will be between six months and nine months, uh, and your, your budget can be proportionately a bit higher if required, but equally we're happy to have a, a project budget of uh, 50k. So the, 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 the range of budgets here is 50k to 400k, both inclusive of VAT. There's something I should need to stress, uh, as a procurement activity, all work on this uh, programme is subject to VAT at the applicable rate, so 20%. Uh, so you need to include that in your budgeting. Thank you, Shino. Uh, I just outlined that graphically just to, to drive it home. So we're only accepting applications in themes one and themes two, which is the increasing customer confidence and making the railway easy to use for all. Um, in the shorter bands, simply because these are these are more related to the current challenges for the railway industry. So getting passengers back on trains, accessing uh, or, or, or accessing new customers and welcoming back customers who've previously used the railways, um, but uh, are doing so less at the moment. So the, the decarbonisation theme, the lower emissions and a greener railway theme is only eligible for group two. So the longer the longer project, simply because we don't think it's realistic to achieve that the, the objectives of that theme in the shorter time. So there's a there's a there's a bit of you, you'll get these slides later. I'm sure Shona will pass them on. There's a bit of a, uh, a clarification of what we mean within these two groups. Thanks, Shona. Um, in terms of allocating the budget, 
it's it's up to DFT really to, to decide how this is achieved, but we'd expect to allocate uh, roughly one third of the budget to group one, so the shorter projects, and two thirds to group two. If you if you follow that through, that actually means we'll fund significantly more projects in group one than, than group two. Um, as I've mentioned before, um, the VAT issue is a, is a constant um, source of amusement for us within Innovate UK. Um, because it, it does confuse. If you're VAT registered in the in the UK, the, the costs for this programme have to include VAT. If you're not VAT registered, you can quote without VAT, but you can't you can't change that later. And uh, it is worth noting some of the larger projects within this programme will, will automatically make you a VAT registered organisation. What we'll offer you if you're successful is a contract for your deliverables. So we'll, we'll have a contract with your organisation to deliver your demonstrator. Uh, and it is a contract, so so it is required that you risk you 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 de-risk your program in, in an appropriate way. That that what you propose is achievable within the budget and the timescales. Those risks are yours, so please bear in mind that your proposal must be fully achievable. Thanks, Shona. And I'm going to hand over to Dan, my colleague, who will take you through a bit more detail on the different themes of the competition. Thank you very much, Kelvin, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dan Piner, and I'm a, a also a rail innovation leader, Innovate UK. So as Kelvin says, on the next few slides, I'm just going to run through the three themes and provide a bit more detail um, on each of these. Uh, but I do also uh, recommend that you please take a look at the uh, competition documents online uh, just to get the full detail there uh, where the, the, sc the scope has the, the full information. So firstly, theme one, increasing customers' confidence and enhancing their experience. So what we're looking for here is technology and innovation to increase public confidence in the rail network and really trying to uh, also encourage previous customers to return to the railway, uh, including those with changed work patterns. I'm sure many of you, as with myself, as with Kelvin, uh, our work patterns have changed quite significantly over the last year. So it would be really interesting to know uh, how we might um, adapt to that to those new patterns also encouraging new customers to embrace rail travel as the transport mode of choice so perhaps pulling people away from the car um, and thinking about um, how that large untapped market of uh, of the uk population can be encouraged to, to travel by rail and thirdly here deliver a more productive travel experience for the business traveler and a more enjoyable experience for, le for the leisure traveler uh, next slide please and the second slide for theme one, uh, it's a few more points. So in, enhancing onboard voice and data connectivity for customers traveling by rail. I think this is really important, again, in this sort of uh, new new world post pandemic where uh, perhaps more people are working outside of the traditional office workplace and more people might want them to be doing work on trains, for example, or passing away time uh, whilst traveling. So really thinking about uh, how data connectivity can be proved is important. Increasing resilience and responsiveness as a result of disruptions. Improving the performance of the rail freight industry uh, and attracting new customers. We know at the moment that uh, passenger demand is down, so perhaps there's um, with new freight paths uh, opening up, potential to do something in the freight industry here. And finally, accommodating a wider range of travel patterns and customer requirements. And there's a few ideas listed here, for example, interior design of trains and stations, uh, onboard storage, maintenance scheduling, timetable, uh, capacity management and innovative storage for bulky items at stations and on trains as well. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. So the second theme is easy to use for all. And um, in this area, we're looking for technology and innovation to support customers in boarding services to help locate seats and to manage luggage, delivering personalised and real time information to customers based on their journey and patterns, including door to door travel and understanding customer movements. Um, so, for example, how they might visit different retail outlets within stations and then go to the platform uh, or standing at the information boards, for example, and better understanding customer preferences and engagement uh, and delivering to those sort of personalised preferences. Uh, next slide. Continuing with this theme, uh, also supporting customers in wayfinding and making connections between services, so improving the, the ease of ease of connections and multimodal um, travel, supporting the precision, 
sorry, provision of real time passenger feedback and supporting new to rail customers to identify and use rail freight services for their operations. Next slide, please. Uh, boarding and using services. Uh, so this is really important for, for passengers which have perhaps have um, mobility impairments, uh, options for disabled passengers to contact a train crew where needed, step-free solutions, um, which would include level boarding between platforms and trains as well, and thinking about that interface, uh, removing hazards and barriers for those with reduced mobility throughout the network. And next slide. Final slide on this theme, uh, better integrating rail travel with other public transport, optimising passenger flows across modes where rail is a key part of a journey, improving terminal operations uh, for customers uh, to enhance the efficiency of intermodal rail freight. And just a note here that any projects which are considering um, the ticketing and retail systems uh, we'll need to get the uh, support of the Rail Delivery Group's Retail Strategy Group um, as a result of uh, ticketing being part of a sort of national policy rather than a fragmented approach or a piecemeal approach. We really uh, would need the support of RDG's Retail Strategy Group for any projects in this area. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And the third and final theme for FOAC 2021 is the low emissions and a greener railway. So three slides here just outlining the scope of this theme. Firstly, technology and innovation to support the in-service fleet deployment of hydrogen and battery powered trains, decarbonizing diesel trains, maintenance and engineering vehicles, and developing power alternatives for freight. Uh, for example, technology leading towards the deployment of hydrogen powered or bi-mode locomotives, uh, including retrofit. Next slide. So de also delivering an energy optimised timetable and real time train speed profiles, decarbonising stations. So this isn't just about rolling stock, but also thinking about other parts of the railway network, including stations, depots and freight terminals uh, with lower emissions and greater energy efficiency and higher air quality. Delivering more efficient electrification. So we know that um, Diesel trains are going to be removed from the network or plan to be removed by the, from the network by 2040. Uh, how can we make electrification more efficient and cheaper uh, and easier uh, from this perspective? And also supporting the delivery of new fuels, for example, hydrogen, uh, but it might be others as well, into rail. So not just the use of hydrogen itself, but how are we going to get that into the infrastructure uh, and supporting the delivery of it to rail? Uh, next slide, please. Enable the sharing of hydrogen fuel by rail and non-rail vehicles, supporting carbon fixing and energy generation, supporting reduced energy use across the rail network, and delivering low-cost intelligent emissions monitoring and risk mapping. Thank you. And the next slide, please. So they are the three themes. As I say, there is more information about um, about the scopes or uh, about the scope, sorry, online. So I would encourage you to take a look at the full competition documents there as well. Just to tell you a bit now about if, uh, projects which we will not fund. So we are not likely, uh, uh, we will not fund projects which are not likely to be successfully exploited by the rail industry and are not ready, uh, are not within a year of being ready for market. So it's really important that um, these can be delivered within the timeframes that Kelvin set out earlier. So uh, by the 31st of March 2022. 20, uh, Do not create a significant change in the level of innovation available in the rail industry. A not well developed technology or do not have low technical risk. Uh, do not have, um, we will not fund projects that, that have collaborations that cannot effectively deliver a demonstration. So this demonstration is a really key critical point um, of the project and um, all projects will need to feature a demonstration phase, uh, which will be immersive and innovative in a railway context. And also really important, we see that um, a lot of projects are outside of, uh, or a lot of applications are outside of scope based on cost. So please check that your project is uh, eligible uh, in terms of the costs outlined uh, on the scope as well. Next slide, please. 
So first of a kind, 2021 is an SBRI competition. Uh, Brian E uh, from Network Rail discussed SBRIs a bit earlier this morning in this morning's session, uh, but it's really important here. Uh, there's a bit of information on this slide, but the critical point here is that um, uh, that this the SBRIs, all SBRIs uh, require at least 50% of the contract value to be attributed directly to R&D. Um, so there are some guidelines shown here of what constitutes R&D, but really uh, important that this is noted for any applications. And this applies to all SBRIs um, of which FOAC 2021 is one. Thank you and next slide please. We have made a few changes for this year's first of a kind competition. So for those of you which are familiar and have maybe uh, applied before, you might see a couple of differences. Uh, there's two here. So the first of which is we've added a supplementary question, um, which is now the question one about previous applications, asking applicants to list any previous applications uh, so that we can help assessors to understand how your uh, new application is different and innovative uh, compared to previous ones. And this, um, again, just ensures that we're getting new fresh ideas uh, for first of a kind. The second uh, change is not a new requirement uh, per se, but is uh, new in terms of now needing to be uploaded to the application process. So whereas previously a letter support letter of support would have just been added. Um, in addition, now we require that to be uploaded to the application along um, before you submit. So you must, as Kelvin has mentioned, you must have a letter of support from a potential customer organization. For example, a train operating company, a uh, rolling stock company, an infrastructure owner such as Network Rail, or a commercial organization delivering products to the railway. Uh, so please upload this with your application. This can be quite short, doesn't need to be, uh, you know, have, have too much uh, detail behind it. It just needs to prove that you do have uh, that support from within the industry. Uh, next slide, please. A few dates outlined on this uh, slide. So the competition opened earlier this week on Monday, and we were very lucky to have uh, Minister Chris Heaton-Harris launch, um, make the announcement and launch the event on Tuesday at our Rail Innovation Exhibition, which is taking place across the whole of this week. And it's not too late to register. There's still some more uh, <laughs> exhibitions and, and sessions going on tomorrow as well. So please do take a look at that if you haven't already. So here we are today on the 11th of February and next week on the 17th, we are um, presenting uh, uh, for the Welsh government as well. And uh, applications close at 11 o'clock on the 10th of March 2021. It's really important. This is this is a hard deadline. There's uh, no applications will be submit uh, will be um, permitted after this. So please make sure you do submit prior to 11 o'clock on the 10th of March. Applicants will be notified whether they have been successful or not on, on the 28th of May or by this date. And projects are due to start on the first of March, first uh, of July this year, and projects must finish by the thirty first of March next year. Uh, more competition details available at the link uh, shown on this slide. Uh, next slide, please. Some top tips um, uh, just before we draw to a close shortly, but some top tips for submitting. Please make sure you read carefully the scope documents and I'd suggest you read them once, read them twice and read them for a third time before you submit anything. Uh, we always see a few errors in applications and it, most of these um, questions tend to be answered in the scope documents themselves. So really would direct you to those online. Uh, when you've finished your application, please reread it before you submit. Pay attention to the expected outcomes in the different priority areas and the themes. Um, think about what the need for your project is. What's the challenge? How does it fit in with the rail industry at the moment? Is your project within scope? Does it address the requirements set out um, by the DFT? Why is it innovative? So why is it innovative? And what is the route to market? How is uh, how have you um, thought about commercialization and exploitation? Uh, the letter of support, as I said, is really um, essential as is a demonstrator to prove that this uh, can be delivered. And as Kelvin mentioned earlier, the risk falls on you as well, rather than Innovate UK or DFT. So please consider this. 
take particular care uh, to not go beyond the eligibility criteria. We've generally seen in previous rounds of first of a kind that about 10% of applications actually fall, uh, fall foul of the eligibility criteria. So please do make sure you think about uh, the costs, the format of the application, uh, the, the composition of the team that you've put together and how it um, how innovative your uh, application is or the product that you're uh, suggesting is. And finally, um, encourage you to listen to the speakers later on this afternoon to who will be showcasing some of the challenges in the industry which are relevant first of a kind 2021. Um, in addition to some of the presentations that we had at the Rail Innovation Exhibition on Tuesday earlier this week, um, and those can also be found online if you want to listen to some of those challenge statements as well. And now if we could just go on to the final slide. Thank you very much. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight as well that beyond first of a kind, uh, there are also some other wider opportunities available um, through Innovate UK. In particular, I would like to draw your attention to the current round of smart grants, which is shown on the right hand side here. So if you go to this uh, website at the top of the slide, you'll see all of the competitions available um, through Innovate UK on the Innovation Funding Service uh, website. Innovate UK smart grants um, are, are one of these uh, sort of critical ones which we're also running at the moment, opened in January and closed in May later this year. And this is an opportunity for UK registered organisations to apply for a share of up to £25 million pounds, uh, to do, deliver game changing and commercially viable R&D innovation uh, to help um, impact the UK economy and uh, in a positive way. And further information about the smart grants is available online uh, through this link. So I would also encourage um, attendees of today's presentation to take a look at that. So thank you very much uh, from myself and Kelvin. That is our presentation and we're happy to take any questions from the audience. Thanks, Dan. That was great. And Kelvin too. I think Kelvin might have answered the questions that have been posted on the chat. I don't know if you want to add anything else, Kelvin. Uh, well, if I've answered them, Shona, that's great. No, uh, sorry, Dan, while you were talking, I was doing some work. No, if that's fine, Shona, unless there's any more, we, we, we'll, we'll be online all, all, all afternoon so we can answer any more that come through on the chat. Would you mind if I ask a question? <laughs> Depends. Uh, so um, I'll go for it and see see um, what you say. If an SME currently operating outside the rail sector wants to participate, would you link them with a suitable rail organisation or how does that process work? Do they need to source one? I'm just thinking of some an SME that knows is maybe not too familiar with who to call, who the best organisations to contact. Yeah, absolutely. We would. Um, yeah, we can help with that. But I would also uh, thoroughly recommend that anyone looking to be sort of linked up with different organisations also, also speak to our colleague Daisy Chapman Chamberlain at KTN, who uh, a very knowledgeable and very helpful um, colleague and always happy to sort of facilitate these conversations. Um, of course, please do also feel free to, um, you know, get in touch with Kel Kelvin or myself as well and we can pass you on to Daisy or help uh, directly ourselves. So yeah, absolutely always encourage um, uh, applications from outside of the rail industry. Really great to get some sort of fresh ideas. Uh, so yeah, absolutely encourage that. So please do get in touch. Thank you. Uh, hi, Sean, it's okay if I ask a question as well? Yes, Paul, Paul Sheeran from uh, Scottish Eng Engineering is going to ask a question too, if that's okay. Hi, Dan, Kelvin. Maybe along the same uh, lines, uh, I was just thinking about um, the companies who maybe have never taken part in an Innovate UK competition before would really like to see them taking, you know, to, to doing that. So I'm wondering if there's a way where um, they can test that they're all on the right right lines, that you know their idea is not completely um, left field, um, before they go to the this extra effort of, of getting a really solid application together and putting it in. Is there any way that that, that, that can be done? Can I, can, I, can I answer that? So so you mentioned left field. Who, who says we don't want left field? Who says we don't want left field applications? So we'd encourage left field applications, please. Uh, we, we get a lot of applications which are almost predictable. Um, so, so we are looking for, for innovation in, to this competition. However, your point is, is well made and, and there is there is a there, there is a, a sort of threshold beyond which teams just are too far left field. So, so there is there is a customer support helpline. If if you look at the cost the the, the competition documents, 
uh, you, you can a team can ask us a question about their idea and whether we think it's in scope. Uh, I'll be honest, we can't answer that question definitively. So, so we can neither say something is is or in or out of scope. All we can say is it's likely to be in or out of scope. And uh, without wanting to pass the buck to Daisy again, um, <laughs> Daisy, who's also on the call, is, is potentially quite a good sounding board. And being independent of Innovate UK, she 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 is in a position to to um, um, to provide uh, less guarded support than we can. We need to be very careful in saying yes or no to anything in case we get it wrong. That's really useful. Thanks. Can I, sorry, can I just add something to that, if that's OK? Um, just to say that just from the from our point of view, when there's a, and Kelvin is used to hearing me uh, play this song a lot, but our, just on, on that, like that, you know, left field might well, it is very well, but we do have very much a, 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 a focus on the ultimate implementation of of these of these um of these projects you know in in the railway so it's you know it have to be something that you know and this you know, pertains to the, the question that, that Shona asked that got to be something that railway rail industry customers are actually going to are actually going to want to to invest in and in, 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 in commercialize and implement at you know uh, at the uh, at the you know, after the after the project is complete. So I suppose that's this also also a, a prism through which you would want to sort of think about and consider those questions. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. Um, I don't think there are any further questions. Now. So I think we should move on um, to Liam Angus from Scottish Enterprise. Is Liam here? Yep. Hi, Shona. Hi. I think my slide, fl yeah, there we are. Um, so, hi everyone, uh, and first of all, thanks very much to Shona for having me along today just to talk about how Scottish Enterprises Funding Information and Support Service fits into the puzzle and, and how we might be able to help um, with, with some of you that are considering applying into the SBRI or any of the Innovate UK competitions. So, yeah, I'm here from from the Funding Information and Support Service, or FIS, as we refer to it, um, which is Scottish Enterprises dedicated service to help Scottish companies access funding from outside of Scotland for technical innovation projects. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of the, the core services that the team provides, but please feel free to follow up with any questions you might have using the email address at the, the bottom of the slide there. Um, so, so how could we help? Um, I'll start with the, the middle point on the slide there, which is probably of most interest and, and most relevant to those in attendance of today's event, um, which is the application guidance and proposal review support. It's, it's probably the core service offering and where we believe that we can add the most value for our, our clients and the companies we're working with. Um, if you're considering applying for funding for a technical innovation project, we can help as you prepare your application by providing guidance on the application process and also provide some tools to hopefully try and simplify drafting your proposal. Um, of course, Innovate UK and KTN are very much the experts when it comes down to the, the scoping of projects and eligibility criteria, the T's and C's, but we work work closely alongside them and we're very much here to offer our support. Um, we've actually developed a, a guidance toolkit specifically for companies interested in applying for public sector innovation funding, which is really designed to help structure your application and also provide some best practice advice, um, which is applicable to most public sector funding, but particularly funding offered through Innovate UK. So please, um, please get in touch if you'd be interested in, in seeing that. Um, the other service that we offer is the proposal um, review support. So we can't actually write your application for you, but we've got a really experienced team made up of specialists from across the organisation who can review draft proposals and offer objective advice and, and critical feedback, hopefully to enable you to put forward your strongest possible application. Um, as experience in the team across most sectors and and also experience of being part of the evaluation process in both national and international funding competitions. So, um, so can hopefully uh, 
add some add some value to your your application through that service. Um, it's it's of course free to to all applicants with Scottish industry involvement. Um, we would uh, help any consortium which is say being led by academia, but there has to be some some Scottish industry involvement for um, to take advantage of the service. The only the only stipulation being that we would ask for a completed draft uh, sent to the team two weeks ahead of any competition deadline. So if you were considering going for the um, the SBRI first of a kind competition, we would ideally be looking for uh, a draft by the 24th of February. However, depending on um, resource, there could be some flexibility on that. So please just get in touch um, if you're interested in finding out a bit more. Um, the other service I just wanted to, to highlight was the horizon scanning. If not for right at this moment, perhaps at some time in the future. Um, it's obviously the, the funding landscape is is complex, so we can help make sense of the, the myriad of funding opportunities that are live at any given time and hopefully identify a suitable funding stream for your project. Um, so if you are considering any other innovation or R&D projects, um, which might not be right for this call. I mean, um, Dan mentioned there the smart call, which we um, have quite a, a good track record of success in, in helping companies access that funding. Please, uh, please get in touch and we can match you up with one of the relevant sector specialists uh, here in the team and, um, and look at uh, those other funding options that might be available. And um, finally, I just wanted to, to highlight as well that we can help you keep on top of any new funding opportunities as and when they're announced through our funding bulletin, which goes out monthly, if not more frequently, but um, at least once a month. And the bulletin is just a compilation of all live funding opportunities from various UK and international funding bodies, um, which are open to, to Scottish companies, but also, well, not just limited Scottish companies, uh, um, open to Scottish applicants, I should say. So yeah, if you're interested in subscribing, or you have any questions about the service or how we might be able to help, then please just contact fizz at scotent.co.uk. Um, and yeah, thanks very much for your time. Hope to hear from some of you soon. I'll now pass over to Scott Prentice. Thanks very much for that. Um, I, my colleague Karampal will deliver the, the first part of the presentation um, and where he'll basically just explain the the the, the, the how, how Scott Rail or what Scott Rail supply chain is and how it works. Um, and then I, I'll pick up on some of the challenges that we've faced on COVID um, and, and what we think are it's probably the biggest challenge that the industry is facing in the, the short and medium term. Thank you, Scott. So I shared the uh, my slides and hope everybody can see that. Is that visible to you, Scott? Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, please. that's okay. good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Good. Um, good afternoon, all. Uh, as Scott mentioned, so I'll give you a kind of. A quick overview, probably uh, this slides is into two sections. First one is uh, we thought it would be good to give a visibility to everyone about the spend uh, segmentation, actually how the how the what makes the cost of our uh, sc um, Scott Rail and uh, that would give a more information for SMEs, the, where the opportunities are and second phase will discuss how we what are we doing to encourage SME participation. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm Karampal Sidhu, uh, Head of Procurement and Contracts at ScotRail. So, so the first slide is really, um, that's, that's the total uh, our spend segmentation and I've, I've categorized into six different categories. So first one, network rail, where uh, charges are by ScotRail are paid to network rail for track access, station lease, or any other performance related schedules. Second block is industry costs, where um, that's made up of subscription for rail delivery group, contribution towards British Transport Police, ORR, or, or um, um, contracts with other train operating companies, business rates for local councils. So that's category is um, um, two. 
Next leads, leads to rolling stock leases. So that's the charges for leasing the trains um, from different uh, rolling stock companies. Again, you can see Porter Brock, Angel, or Evershot, some of those colleagues are here today. Um, next block is about specialist services, where we like uh, all the, uh, I thought it would be impo it's important to categorize this as like, this is an area for probably for SMEs, but may not be directly. It's in the AMO where, where they can engage indirectly through these main contractors, uh, like engine maintenance or class 3 um, AT um, maintenance contract for class 3 AT trains, cubic for ticket gates contracts. Fourth, uh, fifth block is staff costs. And then last but not least is uh, actually the uh, segment which is available to the open market and uh, available for SMEs to directly take part, uh, part in, in the competition. So overall, you can see 82% probably costs are uh, between network rails, staff and rolling stock leases. Next 12% is both specialist category where SMEs may not be directly able to uh, engage in this area, but there are opportunities through the indirect uh, procurement processes. And the remaining 6% is available in the in the open market. So I'll, I'll give you a bit further breakdown of that 6% category. So that's what can the uh, goes out to the I guess is is available to become uh, advertised and tendered in the open market. Within that category, one third of that is already spent with SMEs, so with, which equates to just just over eighteen million. The rem remaining the and fourteen percent is transactional spend, which is more difficult like to plan. These are like ad hoc requirements in short term. Uh, there is very limited opportunity how you can influence influence that spend, whether uh, that goes to SME or non SME. These are short term requirements and uh, needs sometimes very quick response. However, the bigger uh, uh, the remaining category, which is fifty four percent, that's the contracted spend and mostly is due for renewal between now till now and over the next couple of years. And this is a category we are focusing very much on to encourage SMEs say when these contracts expire, go out to market, how we cautiously, consciously and proactively encourage SMEs to take part in. So the, our, uh, the, the, the one third share increases in future. So the options that we are, uh, Considering and some of these are already in place to encourage SMEs is we are reducing um, all our opportunities or procurement tenders are published on PCS, which uh, I assume most of you are familiar with. We are reducing a threshold currently is about 100k and we're reducing it uh, to 50k. So anything above 50k per annum span, we will be it will be published on PCS. So I would I always encourage all SMEs to make sure you're on SM uh, on a PCS and, and and your categories that of spend are selected correctly. So you are notified when this, these opportunities come out in the market. Looking at reviewing our specification evaluation procedures, we recognize sometimes the resources for SMEs to take part in a tender uh, is not same as the bigger organizations. So we're looking at simplifying our specification and evaluation criteria, including some uh, weightage for social element and the circular economic benefits. Uh, look, uh, looking to lot the contract, so make it smaller sizes. Sometimes uh, if SME cannot take part in the whole contract, maybe they can take a part in a part of it and we are lotting the, the future currently and also we will be more proactively and looking at Lotting the lotting the bigger contracts in smaller. A, a reserving category we tried uh, currently like for our uniform contract we reserved that for SMEs that category. So future again contracts we're going to consider certain category just a reserve with reserve for SMEs only. S similar to the number point two, streamline the overall documentation requirements. So we simplify the the feedback that we have uh, taking a feedback from SMEs who are taken part in the tender, wherever the pinch points are, trying to make sure that our documentation requirements are a bit more simplified and easier to easier to understood. 
pre procurement activity engagement again before the opportunity comes and goes out to the market going and warming up to the right uh, SMEs um, uh, we've seen that works really well uh, in recent tenders so just planning that in advance and doing more of that uh, that's in coming tenders that's what we are actively going to be doing feedback from SMEs how how can how they can improve again i think just sometimes uh, Sometimes it's a difficult um, conversation, but it's very important to give the proper feedback, and we've seen a really uh, good response on this. So if you feedback to SME once, then so they know next time what to what to improve on. We do have a uh, SME forum of our tier one suppliers. We we are planning to uh, expand that and make a make a bigger. Uh, the presence and attendance, I guess, at uh, all these buyer events and making sure Scott Rail uh, procurement team, we are going out uh, out and about there and we are visible to answer any questions and accessible to the to the SMEs uh, to, uh, to help where we can. And I guess the last point probably is where biggest impact is uh, with the bigger contracts, how we can through the contracting arrangements we can encourage main contractors to use SMEs in the in the uh, indirectly in the supplying services. So I'll hand over to Scott. Uh, we got more question answer session at the end. I'll hand over to Scott at this um, this place to uh, go through the next few slides. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kampal. Um, so this slide is the, the, the main chart is basically it's the number of passenger journeys in ScotRail by week or per week um, during 2020. Um, so in, in broad terms, we you know we have just under two million passenger journeys a week. Um, so you at the, the, the sort of left hand side, you see the ramp up after the, the festive break. Um, uh, and and then it's it's um, relatively stable, and then come March you've got the cliff edge, um, which was um, when initially when um, the World Health Organization declared um, COVID nineteen as a pandemic, um, and and then and and that was actually the first fall um, to um, around eight hundred thousand. Um, so that was the middle of March. Um, and then the second fall was um, when lockdown was imposed. Um, you've then got um, two to three months of um, around 150,000 journeys a week um, during lockdown. Uh, a nice little climb out uh, during Ju June and July um, and August as restrictions were eased. Um, and then it plateaus. Um, uh, and and re remains remarkably constant um, uh, until um, probably the the end of October when um, the the tiered system came into place and most of the central belt was in tiers three and four and it drops and then pops back up again before Christmas and then drops again um, I, just like during the festive period when the the country went into lockdown. Um, I, and then the you know that will circulate the slides, but the the top graph just then shows that it's exactly the same profile, but it's on different journey purposes. So commuters are people who buy season tickets or flexi passes, uh, and basically what you see is that um, there really hasn't been much increase in those since lockdown. Um, peak um, is basically people who buy either anytime singles or returns. Um, again, that's been pretty constant since lockdown. Um, you see, and, and really the main increase in demand um, following the easing of lockdown was in off-peak journeys, um, but it's still got nowhere near it, its, its normal level. So um, I think you know that, that, that for, for us that, that graph really is the, the, the snapshot of um, just how bad um, 2020 was in terms of the the external events. Um, so if you can move on to the next one, Karampal. Um, so um, what does Scott Rail do? Um, well, uh, I think the we, we certainly changed our timetable more than any other operator in Britain. Um, so so you know the, the industry plans on two timetable changes a year, which are, are generally designed 
um, uh, um, about the, the previous year, uh, or it, it takes, takes a year, um, and their bid to network rail 40 weeks before the timetable change. Um, I'm fortunate to, to work with the, the best timetablers in Britain. Um, uh, that team were turning around the timetable every two weeks um, for at, at some points during the pandemic. And, and what that actually allowed us to do was literally put in, in place a real-time feedback loop where we were consulting with um, NHS boards uh, and using social media to get feedback from customers um, and uh, from key workers who couldn't complete their journey or were suggesting that the trains could, if they ran at a slightly different time, it would um, help their journey either to or from work. And we were being able to change the timetable either the next week or at worst case, the following week. Um, and, um, you know, it was just a, a huge achievement. Um, uh, what's not a sustainable process to do, but it, it, it did rip up the rule book and, and allow people to see what could be done. Um, what we've also done is, is that we've kept the timetable low um, in terms of, to, so, so we, uh, just to match the capacity we're providing with demand, um, um, because for every less vehicle mile that we operate, um, we save on energy, be it diesel or, or electricity. We save on maintenance costs and we save in track access costs. So from the, the little table there, you can see that um, actually in, in 2021, we're now planning to, to run um, you know, just under 40 million vehicle miles less than what we planned prior to, to COVID. And in terms of the value of that, that's about 30 million quid. Um, so, so it's huge. Um, as with other businesses, we had to input or implement new processes very quickly and, and redeploy staff and, and huge credit to not only our staff, but the representatives in terms of the trade unions and, and allowing that to happen so quickly. So, so we completely changed their on-train and station cleaning regimes. And because we were using fewer trains, um, we actually um, took a lot of them to bits to, to repair um, some endemic faults. Um, and undertake um, a, a lot more heavy maintenance so that we were fully caught up and, and, and actually ahead of the curve on, on many of our train fleets to improve reliability once they started to come back into service. Um, and we, we also got away from the, the, the Victorian um, constraint that's sort of been imposed on the, the, the industry in terms of having printed booklets for timetables and posters around every stations that, that have to be um, updated um, every time there's a change. Um, and, and so our, our digital comms became much, much more effective um, with both our customers and our stakeholders. Um, still a long way to go until they're you know, really cutting edge, but um, there was big improvements delivered through the year. Um, we still continued the long-term planning process, so the work that you've heard earlier on decarbonisation um, in terms of developing a long-term rolling stock strategy to, um, to um, complement the, the, the programme of electrification um, and, and how to um, planning on new stations and, and new services. Um, so, you know, what we've now been able to do is that um, we, we we're quite comfortable that the the we can run or meet pre-COVID demand with a, a reduced timetable, um, and we're now working with partners on the the scale of that reduced timetable. Um, so, in, in short, I think that we'll be able to um, pre-COVID we ran 2,400 services a day to carry 100 million customer journeys. We should be able to do that with um, between 2,000 and 2,100 services a day. However, um, and, and this is the, the, the sort of more lateral bit of the presentation, so I've, I've been a bit judicious with how I've applied numbers um, and ignored things like freight and cross-border benefits, um, but just want everyone to take a step back. Um, I, so. In broad terms, pre-COVID, Scottish government's budget for rail in Scotland was just under 1.3 billion. Um, that, that's more than half of the transport budget. Um, there was 
just over 110 million passenger journeys forecast in Scotland um, for that um, for that year. Um, so in terms of monkey maths, that, that means that the government's subsidising every rail journey by just over 11 quid. Um, ScotRail's fare box um, is about 400 million. So our average passenger pays um, just under £4 per journey. So in simple terms, the total cost of a passenger journey in, in ScotRail, both to the end user and taxpayer, is just over £15. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Um, can I, Paul, can you go to the next one? Especially when you consider this. So um, pre-COVID, rail was only 19% of all public transport journeys in Scotland. 6% of people used us to travel to and from work. Uh, and, and actually, we only contributed to less than 3% of all journeys. So now starting to think that, um, can you imagine being the, the, the civil servant that went to a minister and said, I've got this really good idea to use um, an infrastructure um, that already exists. Um, all you need to do, it, it will cost £15 per journey, um, less than 3% of the, or, or less than 10% of the population will use it regularly. Um, and off that 15 pounds, the, the end user will only pay four pounds off it. It's just not sustainable. Um, and, but that, that, that was the position that we were in before COVID. COVID has made it a hundred times worse. Um, and and for, for us as operators, um, and, and we're, you know, we're, guilty party um, in this is that, that we need to find ways to make rail affordable. So again, pre-COVID, um, we provided just under 650,000 seats a day um, um, and carried just over 300,000 journeys a year a day. So just under a 50% load factor, actually it's not that bad. The, the problem is that most of that load is carried within four hours of every day. Um, in terms of the morning and evening peak. Um, so it's a, it's a really poor utilisation of the, the overall resource. Um, what we've heard in, in lots of the earlier presentations is just how important um, public transport will be to, to the decarbonised economy. Um, certainly rail is very well placed and, and is the best mode to transport large numbers of people to and from the urban centres. Um, COVID, for, for us, one of the huge benefits is that it's going to allow us to spread journeys away from the peak, which, which is where most of the cost is. So of, of that 645,000 seats that we provided, um, if you go back to 2015, we were only providing um, just over 500,000. So we've put on 140,000 seats in five years. Um, however, actually, less than 50,000 of them were at times of the day where people were really using rail. Um, so a lot of them were you know, actually not being efficiently used, if at all. And then the last, you know, the big opportunity, a less than a 10% mode shift from car to rail would double their patronage. Um, so that's the prize that we've got in terms of, you know, that we should be going for from decarbonisation. You can go on, yeah, and then the next bullet. So, so for us, um, you know, the rail industry has been really, really good at adding cost. Um, you know, we've had new routes like borders added to the network. Leaving mouth will be coming soon. Um, we've got a big program of electrification, and and whilst they generate revenue, and sometimes you know, so electrification reduces the cost to the operator because electric trains are more reliable and cheaper to operate. Um, but it adds cost elsewhere in terms of infrastructure to maintain. So, so we just keep adding cost to the industry. So for me, the question is, how do we carry that 200 million people? That, you know, that the market will be there for it because of um, low emission zones being imposed in city centres. And I'm sure we will get to a point of road charging at some point. Um, but how do we do that at no extra cost to the taxpayer? So that the government is still only paying the, you know, it was happy to pay 1.3 billion a year into the industry, um, 
Um, but um, so how do we carry those extra numbers without adding cost to the taxpayer or the end user? And I think that's it. And we've got five minutes for questions if anybody wants. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, I don't see any questions on the chat facility, so I don't know if people maybe want to have a think about um, the Scott your slides and post later on. I'm sure Scott and Karanko will answer when um, when they can. Um, if there isn't anything, we should move on to um, Tim Burley from Evershot Rail. Tim's here. Hi, Tim. Yeah. Very um, much. Hopefully there's a presentation as well. Can people see that? Yes. Excellent. I'll crack on then. Thanks very much for the invitation to, to speak and thank you for the excellent scheduling because the uh, overview that Scott's given on, on the costs of the railway is entirely um, consistent with, with some of the themes that, that I'll be bringing out in terms of our challenges. So very, very quickly, um, it's been outlined already, but who is Evershot Rail? Well, we, we're a business set up at, at the time of rail privatisation uh, as one of the primary rolling stock owning companies. And we lease trains currently to 14 passenger and two three freight operators. Uh, within Scotland, we are one of the major providers of electric rolling stock with four uh, electric multiple unit fleets, the three Strathcart Clyde fleets, 31H, 320s and 334s, and the more widely uh, deployed class 380 outer suburban fleet. Um, our involvement with uh, Scotland based um, heavy maintainers and OEMs is again significant. Uh, with, with major programmes underway um, and basically continuing on a rolling basis at Alston Polmody as well as at, at, at Brodie Engineering in Kilmarnock. Because of the nature of our business, uh, we're about 110 people, uh, roughly half are like me, professional engineers and or project managers. So we're very hands on in actively managing our fleets through their lives. But because we're not a huge organisation, our primary, primary contractual relationships tend to be through our tier one providers, namely the, the OEMs and the major heavy maintenance providers. So we, we, re, we rely very much on them bringing forward to us ideas uh, on enhancements and we, we share with them our, our overall plans. So this afternoon in the, the eight minutes remaining, I'll uh, try and take you through some, some of the work we're doing. You'll not be surprised to hear the words decarbonisation figuring very strongly in it. And I won't repeat the material you've all re already heard, but I mean, I'd characterise it very much as electrification plus. I'm fortunate enough to be a member of the, the Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy Programme Board. So I, I, I proudly claim some ownership of the uh, interim and final programme business cases around that. And I do think that the, the recommendations in terms of balance of predominantly route electrification, supported where appropriate by battery trains and by hydrogen trains where electrification is either technically infeasible, um, not cost effective or in, in some areas visually unattractive and therefore unappealing. I think that's the right mix. It's a big challenge as we as we heard earlier on, uh, but it also gives great opportunities. And if we're going to achieve modal shift, that really is the way to go. So how are we tackling that? Well, we can't leave it all till 2035 in Scotland or 2050 in the rest of, of, the, of the UK. We need some early wins. So we're doing work to in, increase the utility of our existing uh, electric fleet so that some of them can operate independently on as yet unelectrified sections of network. 
Our self-powered fleets have a key role, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, and we've also got to recognise that as the programmes of electrification uh, come, come into to being, um, we'll need to get electric trains operating where there is electrified infrastructure. And the realities of new train introduction programmes mean that most of those take, in reality, somewhere between two and a half to four years to realise the, the complete fleet deployment. So the judicious use of existing assets is quite key. In a world with more electrification, we want to buy some more new electric trains. And we've also got, you know, we, we're not afraid to invest in technologies that have long term um, appeal and enhance the, the market attractiveness of our assets. And I'll talk about three of those very briefly in the, in the subsequent slides. So we're predominantly an electric rolling stock business. In fact, back at the time of privatisation, before I joined Eversholt, it was the all electric um, Roscoe or uh, rolling stock company. Um, we just finished successfully introducing two new electric fleets, the uh, 125 mile an hour class 397s for TransPennine Express, which are serving destinations in Scotland as, as well as in the north of England, and the, the CAF class 331s for Northern Trains, part of their major fleet renewal programme. Alongside that, four of our key fleets um, are undergoing development of battery augmented derivatives to provide the greater utility that, uh, that I mentioned earlier on. Um, we're also looking that very, very carefully at our existing asset portfolio of electric trains, some of which are due to be displaced from their current service operations as a result of the large scale procurement of many new electric trains in DFT awarded franchises. And we're very keen in terms of overall rain, rail sustainability and affordability to be able to use those effectively as new electrified lines come, in, come into play. I mentioned earlier our self-powered fleets and we see that they have a key role in delivering overall transport decarbonisation. In our case, because most of our self-powered fleets are relatively new, the, the uh, last of the Class 195s was introduced only, only a few weeks ago, we, ha we have quite a significant residual life over which to recover any investment in those. And combined benefits both of decarbonisation and particularly of improved air quality in stations and built up areas we see as being absolutely essential. Um, we recognise that some of our larger fleets may get split up, um, bought for an initial franchise. Now um, they may end up subdivided into two or three different subfleets where operators have different needs and priorities. So we need a modular approach to that. Uh, you, you've probably seen in the uh, media recently our memorandum of understanding with Hitachi, again on one of our newest fleets, the Class 802 intercity trains operating out of Paddington to the west of England. Um, we're working together very closely to um, replace in a, in a progressive fashion the diesel engines that provide self-powered capability with initially one and then in the longer term more battery packs uh, with a demonstrator unit planned uh, over the next couple of years. Hydrogen also forms a key component of the decarbonisation strategy for those routes that aren't currently electrified nor likely to be. Uh, working with Alstom, who, whose Caradia Island hydrogen trains have just completed over 200,000 kilometres of passenger carrying service in, in Germany. Um, we are working very hard 
towards fleet introduction of what we call class 600 breeze which which provides the propulsion systems proven in Caradia Island and integrates those into a UK gauge train um, with the donor units being class 321 electric trains uh, and they benefit from the work that that uh, we invested in uh, our Renatus program for East Anglia so it provides a complete new train interior environment and major systems very much it's very much a whole system program it's not about the trains it's about it's about integrating hydrogen production and fueling infrastructure maintenance and support um, it's not a trial this this will be a revenue earning passenger carrying uh, fleet deployment of 10 units uh, on Tees Valley services and the relationship that we and Alstom have with with Northern Trains is phenomenal. It's a really important program to us because this whole system deployment will provide practical experience of operating a hydrogen railway to inform subsequent deployments of um, hydrogen propulsion across the railway and also into other transport modes. I think very, finally and very quickly, um, in terms of providing cost effective extension opportunities to the railway, um, Innovate UK launched a lot of initiatives a few years back around reducing the cost and weight of rail vehicles to make a better business case overall for um, the, the reopening and indeed uh, creating new rail lines. So lightweight, lightweight vehicle, hybrid modular power packs. And again, if we're going to get people out of the motor cars, as, as Scott mentioned, we've got to make the rail journey experience attractive for them. So it's got to be a modern, comfortable environment, at least comparable or desirably better than the, than the public transport alternatives. Uh, and our demonstrator vehicles nearing completion uh, in the next few weeks will um, be completing its validation trials uh, with stakeholder demonstrations later this year. I don't need to dwell really on the key challenges we face. Scott articulated them extremely well. Um, We've got a really challenging economic climate and the rail budget is going to come under increasing scrutiny and pressure. We've got decarbonisation legal commitments with a fixed end date, but, we, but because of the other challenges, we're not seeing programmes being authorised as quickly as we might. And it's fair to say also that while there is good support for initial demonstrator programmes, the classic investment appraisal metrics aren't always supportive of in innovative solution deployment at scale. Um, that sounds a bit of a moan, but it, we are seeing things change, but it needs to change quickly if we are going to realise decarbonisation in a sensible way and get early benefits from it. I've used all my time, so I'm going to shut up now and I think it's over to Fraser and Magnus next, but thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thanks very much, Tim. What I might just do, <clears throat> we've got a little bit of time, I might just go, there's a couple of questions that have come in probably for the session before with Scott and Karampal, and it might be, Tim, that questions come in for you later and I'll catch up. Um, with you at the next session, if that's all right. Um, that's absolutely fine, Shona, thank you. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so the first question is from Harris Bokhari. Is AI and machine learning part of the agenda for cost cutting and optimization? I think that'd be for Scott or um, um, so, so the so 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 yes is the answer. Um, and I, I think it, 
it, it has to be adopted across the, the whole industry. Um, if, if you remember in this morning session, I'd given the example of using the forward facing CCTV cameras on our trains as a, and, and combined with AI to um, provide a, 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 you know, a, a daily, if not hourly picture of the network so that um, gradual changes could be noticed and are identified and resources deployed to them appropriately. Um, so, so that you know that that area is part of the, I suppose, the network rail side of the industry. Um, in terms of Scott Rail, what we are a, a, another example that we're looking at is using AI again with CCTV. Um, is basically to count empty seats on trains, um, so that we can then start to tell customers much more accurately than the, the current systems where there's capacity on the the, the physical or the specific train they've got and training CCTV at stations to, to identify um, wheelchairs and bikes, for example, so that we know um, that, that we're, we're needing to give us or some assistance might be required. Um, the, so, so, so I think it, it, it's easy. It, it, it's, it's definitely being investigated, um, but um, I would say that it, it's, it's not being rolled out yet at the, the pace it probably needs to. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the final question is from Stuart Morrison. What actually prevents customers from using the rail network? In other words, why is the uptake of seats so low? Uh, there's a quite quite broad range. First is price. Um, you know, rail is a um, no bones about it, a predominantly middle class transport mode um, within the UK. Um, there there are um, you know, it, it's a you know government policy in terms of how much customers or the share that customers should bear of the industry, um, and and that 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 flips with with different governments as they um, both at Holyrood and Westminster. Um, so so cost is definitely a barrier to to many. Um, also accessibility to to stations um, in terms of you know. Um, a bus. Most people are within uh, a kilometre of a bus stop, um, but um, probably I, th I think the last time I, we had this checked out, it was something like um, um, just over fifty percent of the population of Scotland were within a kilometre of a rail station. Um, so, you know, just the, the ease of access in terms of how you get to and from the station. But the main barrier is that. Um, people still believe that the cost of running a car is just the, the, the petrol or the diesel or the electricity that you put in it and ignore the cost of um, depreciation, of insurance, of maintenance and, and, and until road user charging is brought in or, or some equivalent like that, that's the only mechanism that people will suddenly start to equate the cost of driving with the cost of public transport. Great, thanks so much, Scott. Um, <clears throat> I think um, if it's all right, we'll now move on to um, Fraser Hood and Magnus Conn from Caledonian Sleeper. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, first of all, we yeah, are Magnus Conn, Operations Director, Caledonian Sleeper. So I think uh, a couple of quick things before we, we jump into the presentation, if I may. Um, Firstly, for those of you that know me, I, I do like to rattle on a wee bit. So Shona has got me on an extremely tight lead. So I have skimmed down my 498 slides to 426 um, or three. So I think just building quickly on what both Scott and Tim touched on there, I think for, for me, the, the, the story uh, that Scott's presented specifically with regards to revenue and cost, absolutely fully aligned with that and, and not dissimilar trajectories on the various different models from, from our small little world compared to ScotRail. I think that, that there's two simple things to be thinking about really, and, and one is, Scott touched on again, it's about how we spread the usage on the trains. Uh, not This is an industry issue, not so much Caledonian Sleeper, because obviously we are quite different. Um, but secondly as well, from a cost-based perspective, how we get that cost down. So increase the usage, it sounds very simple, flatten the usage across the day um, and bring the cost down because it is an area we have grappled with for, for a long, long time uh, and it's not easy to resolve. But 
we have to resolve it. I think the second point, just touching on what Tim was talking about as well, very much on the, the 2035 decarbonisation plan. Um, now, in railway terms, just to bring some context for those people that aren't in rail um, business and got old and grey hairs like, like some of us, you know, to introduce an existing, for example, piece of traction equipment that's come from a piece of paper with current technology can very, very easily take be a four to six year process by the time it goes through its designing, through its testing, through its specking, through its bedding in, through its approvals, all the various things you have to go through in a, in a process. So contextually, to do something for where the technology does not yet fully exist and you know, especially for the freight industry and especially for the likes of uh, ourselves at Caledonian Sleeper, where, as you've seen from the government's plan, the West Highland line will not be electrified. Uh, and we have this big lump of diesel uh, local thing that holds us up and down there. So actually, 2035 and a key part of innovation for me is the timing is right now because 2035 is tomorrow in railway terms. Uh, and listen, literally every month we lose as an industry as to where we're going to address these challenges is a month lost. So I think that's, I guess, just my wider context. Um, before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Fraser Hood, who is my head of operations, I really just very conscious that a lot of people might not know a great deal about us because we are small. So I really just wanted to touch very quickly on the sort of five year journey we have had uh, since 2015 and, and where it's come from. So back, um, what are we, first of all? Um, we are different because we are a hotel that happens to be a train operator. And, you know, it is an extremely complex organisation to run. It is a multi-stakeholder organisation. We have government funding for the procurement of the trains. Uh, we have a financier. We have a maintainer that happens to be different to the manufacturer who works on their site. And there are lots and lots of complex, exciting relationships that, that, that certainly keep us busy on a day-to-day -day basis. I think what happened back in sort of 2014, 2015, the Scottish government made the decision that when they were going to refranchise the, the ScotRail franchise, that they were going to split out and break off the sleeper element, which was a very small proportion of the wider ScotRail um, operation. But it was very much recognised that what government were wanting to achieve was to effectively develop a real Scottish based experience um, to actually offer guest experience absolutely at the top of um, the, the priority list. So Circle Caledonia Sleeper, we bid it. The key deliverable around um, the, the franchise was the introduction of the new train. And having um, undertaken a lot of work, we decided that refurbishing was not the way forward uh, on a life cycle cost basis. And equally critically, no matter how much refurbishing we did of the old Mark II or Mark III stock uh, to comply with legislation, actually, we were just not going to create a long term sustainable project. So what we've done is we have designed from scratch uh, from a blank piece of paper, a brand new train concept. Some of the key innovation on the train is ranging from we have for the majority of berths on train private toilets in the berth and private showers. We have double beds, uh, we have single beds, we have bunk beds. So we offer a wide range of innovation and um, especially around things like the double beds and the showers and having the private toilet facilities. That has been fantastic from a guest point of view and I'm delighted to say after some initial well-publicised teething troubles, things have settled down and continue to settle down. Uh, and we're now some 13% most reliable right-time Anglo-Scottish operator in the UK. So the train's getting there. What is it? It's not just about the coaches. Uh, the locomotives had to be rebuilt. They had to be re-engineered. We have a 1960s diesel locomotive that falls north of Edinburgh and mating 1960s technology with 21st century electronics uh, always inevitably brings some challenges, but we have done that. So again, for the innovation point of view, anyone out there of how I'm going to comply the regulations with a traction unit at the front of the train to get us up the West Highland line, uh, love to have a chat. So thank you for that. And just touching quickly before I hand over to Fraser on a couple of the bits and pieces, what you can see below um, on the 
bottom left hand side is the what's known as the club car uh, so it's the old days lounge car where you can have a full uh, three course meal and beverage of your choice and then next to that just again back to the staff engagement side of things this is just a uh, replica of a club coach that we have built for staff training uh, which is a full size replica of the train up in the facilities in Perth and then a lovely little picture of the food and I think that's IPA sitting on the table. And finally, for me, before I hand over to Fraser, um, I think back to some of the big questions that have been asked today as well, and the resilience of rail and how we get back on track post COVID. Um, my personal point of view, and this isn't just a sleeper view, I think it's very much, especially on the longer distance travel, you know, we all know that people look at point to point timings. They all know that people look at nice interiors and nice environments. But with the world we live in now, with the instantaneous nature of social media, um, with the instantation of now, 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 what is the most precious thing in people's life now? Generally speaking, it is time. And when it's time, it's about using that time effectively. And obviously, especially on the sleeper, where you're actually using that travel time to sleep and do something we all need to do, or some of us try to do at some stage, um, that we don't get that message across well as enough in an industry. And from the hassle perspective, what we don't get across well enough is actually getting a flight, Anglo-Scottish or anywhere else, flight from one destination to another in the UK. It's an absolute pain in the backside. And it's a pain in the backside, not just because of um, it's a plane and it's uncomfortable, it's a pain because the sheer number of steps that you actually have to take to make that happen and you don't refer arrive refreshed. Um, and you know you can all count up the steps yourself but from you leave your front door to where you get to with a plane and you are standing in a lot of queues you are going through a lot of detectors you are doing all sorts of things where on a train you jump in the taxi jump on the bus or whatever get on the train get off and go on a bus or taxi to your end destination and i think as an industry for me that's something we need to push hard so as promised i've gone on far far too long um shona i'm pretty sure virtually is kicking me under the table. I will hand over to Fraser. Fraser, over to you. Thank you, Magnus. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and just following on from sort of Mag's um, introduction there around building new rolling stock um, and, and the changes that we've had to deal with in doing that. Um, legislation around accessibility has changed significantly um, over the last few years as well. Uh, and when we were looking at sort of today's event, that the easy to use for all um, sort of strikes quite hard with, with, with ourselves at Caledonian Sleeper in terms of what we've done to date um, and more importantly, what we can still do going forward. And I think some of the things we've touched on today around innovation and technology um, are, are very key to, to us being able to do that. Um, when we looked at accessibility within our business, um, we've sort of classed it with the, the five barriers to accessibility. Um, and probably the two just to touch on at the moment would, would be around uh, our organisation um, and, and technology. Uh, and when we look at our organisation, it's, it's how we operate, it's the people we have, um, the one way of working that I'm sure many organisations try to, to put in place. It's using the, the training and the tools, it's using that equipment that's available. Um, and, and training is one area where we've, we've really been sort of quite pioneer. Um, approach to um, in terms of all our staff now have now completed, and that's from managing director down to frontline, have completed accessibility training. Um, and, and really what our business is about is that guest experience. Um, in terms of technology, we, we continue to work with the, the advances in technology for with on, on board the train, from the onboard computers to, to data loggers we've touched on earlier on there to um, remote monitoring equipment that we've now um, started to install as well. Um, but all of that's very good if you like trains, but if you're a guest, what does that mean for you? So one of the first areas that we've spent a lot of time and effort on is, is our website. It's been completely overhauled, um, very much around that guest experience. So when people first arrive at thinking about Caledonian Sleeper and, and they go on our website, we've made that journey um, easy for everybody, but particularly around people with accessibility issues and challenges. Um, around 80% of our guests book via our website. Um, so what we've had to do in there is make that very, very user friendly. There's lots of videos and photographs of how the train works. So what is your experience going, going to be like? Um, 
We've got our accessibility policies and charter on there um, to, to help people who maybe be a wee bit concerned about travel um, and being able to help them plan their journey. And I think we would all agree that sometimes travel can be slightly challenging, particularly when you look at what we do but with being a, an overnight operator. Um, once we've, we've got guests on board um, in terms of booking tickets, one of the other things we, we implemented was our lounges. Now, many of you will have seen these popping up, um, particularly across Scotland and Inverness, Fort William, um, Dundee and Stirling, for example. Um, and this is probably the first part of, of, of the, the experience for, for our guests. And it's very much around that um, people who we have a, a passenger assist programme where people with accessibility issues, we, we look to, to encourage them to use this environment prior to and even post journey. And it's very much about providing us a safe and secure environment for guests to get sort of take, take stock and try and reduce that level of stress before embarking on their journey. Um, and one of the key things that we've, we've put in there is um, you, you'll see from the, the colour scheme, um, you'll wonder why we've chosen that. Um, it reflects what's on the train and that familiarisation um, of, of, in continuity is something that we, we, when we engaged with our um, focus groups, it was one of the things that came out quite clearly was familiarity and that's why we've put that in place. So very much uh, the, the, the journey begins from, from our lounges. Um, the next big area, though, that we're working hard in is our stations, um, particularly in Scotland. There's a lot of stations that have still not went through that modernisation programme. Um, we're still working with Network Rail and Scott Rail and, and understanding the access for all challenges. Um, there's, some of the stations still don't have the, those visual announcements. Um, so for, for, for our guests, what can we do to, to, to support them on that? So we've we've created um, our own station accessibility guide. Again, you can find that on our website. And um, we do deploy station support um, at some locations, depending on, on volume of guests. Um, and, and very much we, we continue to work and, and be part of that stakeholder group within Scotland Railway um, to make sure that, that all our stations are fit for, for everybody. Um, and then once we've left the stations, we tend to find ourselves on board our train. Um, as Mag touched on, a lot of legislation, a lot of um, rules and regulations around compliance for, for accessibility rooms, um, which are all um, compliant, as you would imagine, with the, the various standards that are out there. Um, and some of the things we're doing about on board, again, is that personal touch. So what can we do for, in terms of room service? What can we do in terms of our guests being able to communicate with, with each with our staff? And we've developed um, a, 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 an application for, for mobile devices, which takes you really from that journey, from when you book right through to, to being on board. And we talked about technology advances um, earlier today. We are now in the, the sort of early stages of developing our, what we are going to call our at seat app, which is very much around that people within the seated coaches or people within their rooms will be able to use their devices to, to, to order room service or, or ask for advice or, or even find room guides um, to help them enjoy their journey. So <clears throat> very much, I, I think we've been very, very uh, um, good. And I think we're, we're quite um, certainly leading in, on a number of key areas around accessibility. But listening today to some of the things this morning um, around technology and, and what other um, things are out there, it certainly opened my eyes to, to what more can we do. Um, and as always, um, our success is not just about what Caledonian Sleeper is and does, it's very much about what the industry does. And, and I would encourage anybody today who's got ideas to not only just help Caledonian Sleeper, but help the industry around making that overall experience better. Um, let's share them and let's work together as an industry because um, as, as you've seen today, we've got from technology and websites right through to stations, and this is all about the guest, and that's why we're here. Um, so I don't have anything more today. I'm happy to take any questions, or, or I'm sure Mag will. If it's not, okay. we can hand over. Thanks so much, Fraser, Fraser and Mag. Um, we're just running a little bit behind time. Um, so maybe you did speak well, Mag, for a wee bit longer than you should have. <laughs> um, anyway, we should maybe hand over. If we get time at the end, we'll catch up on questions. Um, but if maybe we could hand over to McCulloughs and um, just to say to McCulloughs to be aware of the time that's we're only just about five minutes behind. So that would be great if you could help us out there. Thank you. No, no problem. Can you uh, hopefully you can see my slides OK? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mike. Super. Okay. Um, I'm Mike Smith. I'm the head of business development. I will be um, I'll be sharing uh, the presentation with Jake Rudham, um, marketing director for Unipark Rail. Um, so I'm going to take you just on a bit of a whirlwind version of the McCulloch Rail journey. Um, hopefully, it's going to be an inspiration to the innovators, the collaborators, and to Scottish entrepreneurialism. Okay, so hopefully everything works. So McCulloch started in 1992. Two brothers, Billy and Danny McCulloch, started in the vegetation management business. It really is a, a Scottish business success story. It started with £40 a week Prince's Trust grant, where uh, they built the business gradually and undertaking quite a bit of trackside vegetation clearance work. This was their introduction to the railway. That enabled them to grow the business, to further invest in plants as the business grew, and uh, then started to introduce their own innovation to the activities that we're doing. And they developed the first road rail chipper in Scotland, which subsequently was deployed into England successfully. So that's where the innovation, as well as the work ethic, started the business uh, success. They then expanded into other on-track methods, winning rail scrap recovery work. Just a little bit of background about the business. It's headquartered in Ballantry, South Asia, a provider of tra rail track renewal and maintenance solutions um, and under the McCulloch Rail banner. Four sites, 120 staff. We've recently um, restructured the business um, and I'll go on to a, a, an acquisition that contributes to that a little bit later. Um, but it's, we have an international arm to the business now. That's located in Kilmarnock, uh, a facility that's part of the acquisition. And we provide infrastructure equipment solutions uh, to the rail network outside of the UK. So we've had recent successes in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and Malaysia. Quite a small team, but quite an agile team with a, uh, a great development capability behind us. Just to put a bit of context into how McCulloch created their wherewithal, their being, they looked at the problem differently to other people. They saw what was happening on the railway. They were looking at the tasks that were being undertaken and everything seemed to involve big plans. It seemed to be slow, seemed to be cumbersome, lots of investment. Billy McCulloch is the entrepreneur of the business and um, he, he took the problem problems away and uh, he was found in the middle of the night by his, by his wife one, uh, one stormy night pacing around the garden with a, a 56 weight between his legs. He found the idea. He knew what people were doing differently. All of that other equipment was not doing it in the most efficient way. It was all doing weightlifting at distance. What Billy realised, if you put the weight between your legs, you can carry a lot more. Pretty obvious. With doing, a, with, with doing it the right way, you can lift a lot more with less. So hence, Jenny was born. So Jenny was the, the original TRT, track rail transporter. This was uh, this came to reality and it was patented in 2005. Following uh, su successfully securing network rail approval, we then got custom engagement across the UK, UK and it quickly proved itself on the track. With the courage, conviction and dedicated workforce, it's become a huge success. The McCulloch Rail team now have over 60 machines working day and night across the UK network. It's the core of the McCulloch Rail UK business, which is a service offering working these machines, delivering services to the to all of the major operators, and major contractors within the UK network. But the TRT continues to evolve. It's not a case of standing still. The machine, it doesn't just do what its primary initial purpose for, was. it's also a tracked power pack. We've added additional capability, creating a crane with a jib, enabling the plow to plow the ballast, a rail saw to cut the rails. We've also got a rail drill, impact rents, air compressor, and a number of other uh, tools that we're incorporating into it. essentially anything that can be hydraulically powered. So this brings a versatility to the machine that, that, um, that enables the, the better value from the client base. Subsequently, taking that similar principle, as you'll see some of these machines offer the same kind of principle, we've created the panel lifter, the McCulloch multi-purpose vehicle and the flask machine. Each have unique characteristics of, of the conventional methods. Essentially, we've now got a full track renewal system that can actually uh, remove and install a, a mile of rail track in one day. The most important element to this is this: these solutions are relevant anywhere in the world and that's starting to prove the case. So just in terms of the UK aspirations is to further expand our reach, invest in further locations, also look at the challenges that the UK marketplace has and understand how we can help 
uh, meet those challenges and deliver new technologies, new methods of working to fulfill those needs and build on our reputation as the safest choice. In terms of innovation, um, our solutions, it is a solutions based approach. What we've done in even in the last 12 months is innovated um, on behalf of our client base by understanding their challenges because we have that intimacy with the real orientation, the real track uh, teams, we can determine the problem, we can come up with a solution. So here's a few examples. In the last 12 months, we've, we've converted our TRT into a remote control version. We've, we've developed a universal mountable rail ramp, particularly useful for getting equipment and tools and people down a, a, a tunnel, a tunnel environment. And we've also developed a rail trolley system to carry rails, panels, any number of materials down the track. So that was uh, that was a rail trolley delivered into, into New Zealand. Subsequently, uh, we was engaged with the team in Irvine, the S&T &S team in, in Irvine. They had a problem with cable deployment. They've got big projects to deliver cable deployment. From talking to them in November, this machine was developed from concept through to final uh, final machine, and it was actually put out to its first task the night before last. This enables them to take the, the, the rail track, uh, sorry, the cable down the rail track with ease. Supporting that using our MMPV, we're in the process of, of finalising that to go out to support that cable delivery programme by delivering the cable reels line side so that the TRT, the TCT can now deploy them. So just to expand on that a little bit more, we've got a number of projects also going at the same time. We're looking at how we can make our panel lifter, this is for a client in Australia, how we can make our panel lifter adaptable to carry slab track in a tunnel environment. And then beyond that, when it comes to maintaining the, the, the slabs, how can the system be used subsequently, particularly in confined areas? It's all about solutions, looking at how we overcome the challenges that client has. Just to focus a little bit more on the MMPV, and I picked up the, uh, some of the challenges around electrification earlier. Uh, the MMPV um, is essentially a fully flexible, adaptable, self-propelled, rail-borne and road-transportable platform. As that picture shows there, it's got rams that enable it to track itself on and off the track. So essentially it can be loaded up with materials, equipment, people. As a flatbed, it can be adapted to put any number of uh, equipment on it, and it can track itself onto the track and off the track at the end of its shift. It's also, importantly, it's, it's road transportable, so it doesn't require a rail track, a rail line to get from A to B, which again takes a lot of the pressure off the rail network. Mac 2 is, is a, a fully flexible platform. But I've just a few examples of um, considerations that we've put to how we might use that platform for different uses. So um, I picked up from the presentation, from Hugh Evans' presentation earlier, the, uh, the amount of equipment that's used in some of the, uh, of the electrification tasks. And I think I can count eight pieces of equipment on there. Whereas if you had a flexible platform like this, then I think you could bring that count down. Just to expand on that. So if innovation is at the core of what we do, we need to make sure that we can be agile. So in December, we, we completed the acquisition of a, of a long established business, Smiley & Cuthbertson, trading as s &C Engineering. Um, a manufacturing business based in Kilmarnock and Helford. That gives us over 50,000 square feet of production and development capability and a team of very, very competent engineers, production staff um, and designers that can help us take an idea and convert it to a reality. What does it enable us to do? Take the idea, come up with a concept design, develop it into a theoretical use scenario, develop it further to enable more qualitative discussions with the client and confirm performance specification before we've cut them, develop the prototype and then deliver the final version. Essentially, we've, we're a business of rapid development from idea to repeatable products approved for use. In terms of our, our collaborative element, you can do this on your own. We've, our aspirations are obviously uh, much further than the UK. We're collaborating with logistics manufacturing and supply chain giant Unipad Rail, um, and I'll be introducing you to Jake shortly. So that's to exploit our technologies worldwide. And since we collaborated with Unipad, we've already developed in excess of 80 firm leads across most continents and delivered, as I say, equipment solutions into the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, and Canada. So from the heart of Asia, Scotland, it really is a global success story. Jake will cover it in a little bit more detail, but one of the uh, development programmes that we're working with with Unipart and a number of collaborative partners is converting our equipment 
to electric. That's going to give us the first zero emissions fleet in the, in the UK network, but also in the world. So it's very hard and very slow to succeed on your own. So any innovators out there, I would re highly recommend that you consider where your core competencies are and partner and collaborate with entities that can fill the gaps. So I'm going to hand you over to Jake, who's going to talk through Unipart. OK, thank you, Mike. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, so I think uh, just to clarify my role within this, so marketing director at Unipart, I'm also responsible for our initiative on bringing new product to market. So I've got a team of product managers that are across various clusters. One of those is the area that we refer to um, uh, rail plant and uh, and what we're doing with McCulloch um, firmly sits in that. So McCulloch is um, rightly recognised as a, an innovator um, within, within the rail sector and make no mistake that that technology um, in many respects is disruptive um, and brings new efficiencies um, to the um, delivery of, of rail projects. So what is the that we bring? Well, I think what we we help them to do um, is realize their ambitions while allowing them to retain control of what's important to them. You can see on this slide in terms of, you know, we've clearly got scale. Um, we're a significant player within the UK rail sector um, in terms of number of employees, et cetera, and part of a bigger group on which we can bring to bear in terms of Unipart Group. Uh, cover the broad remit um, of a rail in terms of signalling and traffic management, infrastructure and traction and rolling stock. And where we play there is that we manage supply chains, um, we aggregate disparate product uh, and work with um, the end customer to deliver that in an efficient way. But we're also a technology player in our own right. We have our own technology and we work very closely with um, third parties to bring new technology to market. We just go on to the, the next slide, Mike. OK, uh, in terms of just give, you know, alluding a little bit more in terms of footprint, um, we're well known in the UK, but we're also operating um, globally. So we're very much on the ground in Australia. Um, we have a partnership um, with UGL there, um, very well known in that market. We're also on the ground in North America. Um, we've been there for quite some time as doorman um, and we've acquired a business there and we're looking to grow um, in North America. And then in terms of the Middle East, we have um, a, a JV to service that region. Um, we we'll also have a JV um, uh, with Lucchini um, and we have and are operating in Europe um, in our own right as Unipart Rail and through Group. Um, and then we've also got some people and access into the market in Asia Pacific and Africa. In terms of you know, who we work with, um, People will be very familiar with these names. In short, you know, we work with um, all of the end customers, Network Rail, TFL, etc., all of the tier ones, um, be it contractor or OEM, etc., the TOCs, the Roscoe's, etc. Um, we're kind of pretty sort of ubiquitous uh, in the UK rail industry and have some strong relationships internationally as well. So in terms of you know, that helps you understand a little bit about reach and footprint, um, which is what we're providing to um, McCulloch there. But it's not just about that. Um, we are working with them and we are um, the manufacturing partner. So um, Unipart Rail and Unipart Group has a strong um, um, capability um, within manufacturing. We um, um, we not only legacy manufacturing, etc., but we are manufacturing um, both the, um, the the TRT and the panel lifter um, in volume, and we're hoping to move into other areas with McCulloch to uh, manufacture further equipment for them. And then innovation. So innovation is um, is very important um, to our business. We do um, a lot of projects and have done over the years that are Innovate UK funded, working with um, other SMEs. Um, we are a member of Ukraine. Um, for those of you that don't know, the UK Rail Research Innovation Network. Um, that is um, one of the, that is a, a partnership between industry and, and um, academia. And we're working um, with them on that. Now, the, the key thing I'd like to highlight here is that as part of that, um, we have established and are establishing a innovation centre um, at, at our um, offices in, um, in Doncaster. 
um, and uh, where we will have all of the um, uh, key, kind of key centres across Ukraine represented um, in terms of both the, the DigiRail piece, um, the infrastructure piece and also the traction and rolling stock. So working with all the university centres there and also with Network Rail, where we'll be showcasing the latest um, kind of innovations coming out of those organisations but also looking and seeking to commercialize a lot of that innovation. One of the projects that we've got there is a project with um, Sheffield City Region, looking to bring new companies and new innovation into the rail supply chain and working very closely with, um, with Birmingham and DigiRail um, on that. But it's not just in terms of companies in the region, we're keen to work with um, SMEs um, across the UK, across the piece, to bring new innovation um, into the rail sector. And if we go to the next slide, OK, so Mike talked earlier about um, the development of the TRTE. Uh, this is a project um, that uh, we are working on with, um, with McCulloch uh, and other, other partners. Innovate um, UK are funded and we, we hope to be demonstrating that um, later in the year. It speaks very much to the theme we've heard today uh, in terms of decarbonisation uh, and zero emissions. Um, and one of our partners involved in that um, is our joint venture Hyperbat, which is with Williams Advanced Engineering. Our interest in this is not just to sort of develop a, um, a, a, an electrified TRT. It, it then extends out into um, electrifying other plants and you know, other things that we can do in terms of uh, battery technology um, in the rail sector. So it's a really key, important project for both Unipart um, and for um, um, uh, McCulloch. And then to move on to the next slide. So it's not just about McCulloch, we're keen to work with um, uh, SMEs across the UK to bring um, new innovation um, into, the, uh, into the rail sector. Uh, and I think, you know, as we've done with McCulloch, I think we've got something to offer there. So we're keen to he hear from you if you're keen to talk to us. Um, my contact details are there. And with that, I'll hand you back to Mike. Thank you, Nick. So thank you for your time. Um, if you want to learn anything more about the McCulloch experience or to collaborate with, with Unipower or ourselves, if you want to learn from our first of a kind um, experience, uh, successful experience, then please get in touch. Thank you very much. I'll uh, pass you over to Richard Kemp Harper. Apologies, if we're a bit late. Thank you, Mike and Jake. Um, thanks for that. Uh, so I think a couple of slides should be popping up. Thanks very much, Shona. Um, so I'm Richard Kemp Harper from Arcona Energy. Um, just a quick plug about a piece of work that we're doing in a project um, that's running at the moment. Um, and then something for you to get involved in. Um, so please do hang on for the last couple of minutes because um, there might be something in it for you directly after this. Um, Arcola Energy is working with Transport Scotland Scottish Enterprise, the hydrogen accelerator, on the project to deliver um, Scotland's first hydrogen train. You've heard about um, uh, Evershoals and the Alstom, about the Breeze already. Um, but uh, this is a project that's happening in Scotland. We are hoping to announce very shortly the establishment of our facilities in Scotland. Um, and part of the current project is to work with potential Scottish suppliers to say, OK, what have you got? Um, either that's ready or might be ready, suitable for this new technology to go into this next um, technology that's coming along to support the delivery of um, uh, decarbonized rail system. So um, our background is in automotive um, and but we're translating our A drive platform, our fuel cell and hydrogen technology platform into the rail sector in this project and hopefully for other projects. So this is just a quick cutout diagram of the sorts of things that we're looking for and the sorts of opportunities there are across the system and this will apply to other similar Traction, traction platforms um, of this sort of technology. So obviously a fuel cell, that's the sort of technology we're based on. Um, and they, we're looking at high power systems with a long lifetime. And there's opportunities, not just in the fuel cell as a module and a system in its own right, but in components of that, such as the compressors and the air supply and various pumps and blowers that go along with it. Hydrogen tanks, um, that's 
unlikely to be your expertise. There might be an opportunity in that. But there's a lot of pipe work and assemblies making a safe, compliant hydrogen assembly that stops hydrogen getting where it's not supposed to and provides the structures um, to support the tanks as well as the pipe work and regulators and valves and so on. We're looking for high power batteries. Um, and I know there are some companies in Scotland that are looking at that as a technology. Um, probably a, another area might be of interest, power electronics, pure cell DC, DC, inverters, distribution, high voltage, low voltage conversion, integration with um, of traction systems um, with say an EMU, for example. Also the motors that might convert a, a, a DMU to work with an electric drive rather than um, the traction system you've already got with a diesel. And things around thermal management, heat exchangers, uh, radiators and that sort of thing for batteries, fuel cells um, and power electronics. So there's a whole suite of things there. If I could go on to the next slide, Shona. Um, so we'd like to hear from you about the sort of stuff which you've got um, and that might be relevant to this. So we've got a project which is funded by the Automotive Transformation Fund um, and we're doing a market opportunity assessment across rail but also across a whole load of um, different uses of fuel cell electric technology in heavy duty vehicles, road, off road and rail. Um, and there's a survey that we're running around those different strands that I've highlighted and we're trying to get um, engagement from potential suppliers with this opportunity to uh, share what, what you've got, your capacity, what R&D needs you might have to be able to get you up to the spec, either for rail or for automotive. Um, and then, yeah, we'd love to potentially work with you in the future um, in R&D or, or product development. So there's a link to the survey. I will put it into the chat right now. And um, if you want to drop me a line, that's my email address just there. Look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Richard. That was that was great. Um, I'm just going to conclude now since we're right at, well, we're five minutes past three. Um, a great big thank you to all the fantastic speakers today. I'm sure you'll agree there was so much brilliant information to absorb there. Thank goodness we've recorded it. Um, a special mention to Alan Ross um, from Network Rail and his rd &I team. Innovate UK and um, Scottish Enterprise for the support in organising and uh, and helping with this event. And um, thank you very much. And a great big um, thank you to everybody who attended in the audience. Um, if your questions haven't been answered, please be reassured, reassured that we will get to them um, after the event. Um, have a great rest of your Thursday, and thanks again for attending. <laughs>